So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Chris to tell us all about his wireless hacking to toy box. Uh, I'm like excited and scared, as I'm sure some of you all are. Do we all need to turn our phones on to airplane mode? <laughs> There we go, that seems like a good idea. All right, give us just a second here to swap some laptops around and we'll get started. All right, so give you guys a fair warning ahead of time here. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot in this talk and I'm gonna go really fast. <laughs> I'm not gonna get real detail into anything, um, just a heads up on that. My initial, my initial uh, lecture was to go over every single device that you see up here. Um, I've cut out three or four things <laughs> um, so a lot to cover there. I'm going to go kind of fast and just to give fair warning for anybody who needs to leave at 8 o'clock at the end, uh, might go a little bit over. I won't be offended because it's supposed to be over at a specific time. So if you have to get up, that's, uh, that's fine. I understand. So uh, as with any ethical hacking lecture, tutorial, uh, live demo type of thing, you have to have one of these. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to read it right off the slide here. Um, SGF Devs, uh, Hackwoods Academy, which is a, that's my organization, uh, me, Chris Kincaid, uh, or anyone else associated with this lecture are not responsible for anyone's actions. <laughs> we're, we're not telling you to do anything or showing you how to do anything. You are responsible for what you do. Uh, this lecture is for awareness, education, and entertainment purposes only. Some of the actions took and discussed during this presentation if done incorrectly, could be illegal. All the viewers are fully responsible for their own actions and understanding all laws before emulating anything in this presentation. So with that said, we can move on. That's kind of like the ugly part that has to be said. Um, me, who am I? Um, I think I have a, a, a spot to stay in, to stay in the camera there. Um, so my name is Chris Kincaid. Uh, professionally speaking, I'm not exactly a noob to the industry, uh, but I'm also not an expert either. I'm somewhere in the middle, closer to noob than, uh, than expert. Um, I have a one year as a security analyst, uh, two years as an endpoint security software tester, and I have a whole barrage of uh, academic background. Uh, two bachelor's degrees in computer information, criminal justice, a bunch of associate degrees, information systems, law enforcement, um, business stuff, recording arts, and I'm currently in school to get my master's degree. Um, that's professionally speaking. Personally speaking, I really like to make stuff do stuff that it's not supposed to do. <laughs> I just love doing that. Um, I'm an information and security ethical hacking nut, so um, I live and breathe this stuff. Some people play video games, some people watch football games. Um, this is what I do. <laughs> This is what I do. I, I collect these things and I, I play around with them. Um, at the current moment, I'm working my butt off to network. I want to meet you guys. I want to know you guys. I want to know what you guys have to do. Uh, I'm instructing courses. I'm giving lectures. Um, I instructed a course at OTC last semester. I've looked forward to maybe doing that again in the future. Um, I'm giving lectures. I'm attending events. I'm attending lectures. I'm joining groups. And I've even started my own uh, information security group that I would love for you to join if you're interested in. Um, it's called Hackwoods Academy. Uh, website is www.hackwoods.academy. And if you're interested, you can go there and sign up for the newsletter and take it from there. So what are we talking about? What is this lecture about? The scope and the foundation. Um, you can't have a lecture without some type of uh, education stuck in there. <laughs> so what we're talking about is security awareness of wireless communications. Um, and I just realized if I look down, it gets really loud on you. Uh, wireless communications is any devices communicating over radio waves. So what are radio waves? Radio waves are electronic, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, I like to use this picture because most pictures it looks like this, like a pop locking. <laughs> um, but really, it's not really the way it works. It's not a flat thing. Uh, it's electro, uh, electric and magnetic uh, oscillating waves is what we're talking about. That's how things are, are communicating. Um, as far as we're concerned, that's as far as we're going to go into it. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, though, um, it is, theoretically, it's continuous. Um, these, these waves that I'm talking about, uh, they get um, as small as like pieces of atoms is as far as humans can measure and understand. Um, 
but theoretically they go as small, smaller and smaller as they possibly can get until your Ant-Man um, quantum realm. They go the other direction as well. As far as humans can tell, they get as big as football fields, but there's no reason to think they don't get bigger. Um, they could be as big as planets, as big as universes. Uh, it, it's crazy to think. Um, we're obviously not covering all of the electromagnetic spectrum. We are just talking about the radio frequency band, um, which is a little of the EMS. What we're not talking about <laughs> There's a lot. In that little bitty sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum, there is all of this, and this is just the way that the United States chops it up. Um, you can spend a lifetime trying to learn all of that stuff. Uh, we're obviously not going to touch on all of it. Um, stuff that's worth mentioning that we're not going to touch on, television broadcast, uh, two-way radio walkie-talkies, telemetry systems, which is like um, systems that would remote control farming equipment, stuff like that. We're, we're not going down that road. Uh, we're not going to talk about submarines or, or satellites. Um, just there's a whole lot that we're not talking about. What we are talking about are my toys. <laughs> uh, my toys that I have collected uh, over time here. Um, we have software defined radio, we have FM transmitters, I uh, have some RFID readers and writers, um, touch on cell phones a little bit, uh, Wi Fi adapters, ESP Marauder. Um, there's a star by the Wi-Fi pineapple because uh, it recently quit working on me in the last couple days. I think the SD card in it just went bad. But it's also the cheapest model you can buy, so maybe it's just had it for like seven or eight years. Um, maybe it's just had its time. Uh, if anybody's heard of a, a Ponagachi, those are freaking awesome. <laughs> You'll see that. Uh, and then the Flipper Zero that it, pretty much everybody has heard about at some point in time by now. And then War Drivers. So like I said, a lot of stuff that I packed into this. Um, and we're just gonna start right off with uh, RFID uh, and NFC. So uh, RFID is, this thing's in my way now because I got RFID in my pocket. So you probably all have some version of RFID right now. Uh, hello? Okay, I'm so glad. Uh, payment cards are NFC, which is a type of RFID, like this. And just to demonstrate RFID, uh, well, let's not get into it just yet. Let's kind of go over what, what RFID is. So RFID is a, uh, a passive device, like your card, uh, has no power to it. Um, the power comes in the reader that you bring your RFID device to. Um, widely used in inventory, uh, access control, supply chains. Uh, the range can be very long. I, I honestly don't know, but my guess would be somewhere around 30 feet for regular RFID. Uh, NFC, which is used for uh, contactless payments and phones and cards though, it has a standard which requires it to not be, it's, it's like centimeters, you have to be close um, to get it to read. So basically the way it works is you, um, uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, whatever frequency standard the RFID is set at, uh, whenever it comes in contact with that, uh, with that uh, uh, radio waves, it just, it just farts out whatever data is on it. Uh, there'll be a little chip in there and it just shoots out. Uh, it can hold uh, a half a kilobyte to two kilobytes, I believe, is what RFID is set to hold. And I just stuck this in here because I found it super interesting. Um, this is obviously a huge hint. We're in the RFID section, and it says <laughs> the future of RFID. But does anybody know what we're looking at here? That, the, that, the, that black line across there is a human hair, yes. And those little black squares are actually RFID chips. Um, this is called smart dust. So you've heard of smart toasters and smart refrigerators, and you think they can't get any dumber. Uh, they have smart dust now. Uh, there's obviously some things that us as a society need to think about <laughs> because of their radio communications in dust. Uh, there's some things that probably need to be talked about as a society. We're going to talk about toys. Um, so these are some common RFID readers. Uh, Oh, Flipper Zero's up there. Um, we're gonna go over that 
uh, one with the um, Chinese writing on it there. Uh, these range anyway. The ones I have, I bought uh, like directly from like Alibaba or AliExpress or something for like three or four bucks, <laughs> like a long time ago. I would say now they're probably maybe 20 with inflation over the last five years. <laughs> um, but they're super cheap. But you can get, you can go all the way up to thousands of dollar ones that, that, that uh, do RFID for cars driving by and things like that. But, so my toy box, it's actually RFID. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Run! <laughs> I really like this little table right here. We're gonna have, this table's gonna be full by the time we're done here. So uh, these are the ones that I got for like three or four bucks. Um, it's weird because I've seen this exact same casing in air condition remotes and stuff like that. It just seems to be like the staple thing that they use. Um, and it, it, these little cheap ones, uh, they only do uh, 125 kilobytes up to, to 500 kilobytes. Um, and if you guys want to check them out, you can. You can go, go other way around. Like I said, they're super cheap. I would like to have them back, though, if you guys want to pass them around and check them out. Um, disclaimer, remember the disclaimer at the front there? So those are active. They do work. They will read RFID cards, and they will write over them, too. So if you have, any, uh, if you have anything that's super important, don't go, don't go holding your card and pressing buttons. <laughs> it won't do your credit card. It doesn't, do, it doesn't do anywhere near that frequency. It's safe. Um, but this one, this one is by all means my favorite. This is like my little buddy. It, uh... I'm Canadian. I need 125 kilohertz. It's got a cute little voice. It like talks to you. Um, so it actually tells you what frequency it's currently reading. 250, pretty cool. So with this cheap one here, and I think this one was like 10 bucks. Uh, I, I've had these for decades, some of the things, so I, I don't know, but not expensive. So we're locked. This is a RFID device. This is what happens whenever it doesn't work. So if we take your one that does work. I'm Canadian. I need 125 kilohertz. Shh, chill. Read success. Card number is 3, 6, 1. Read success. Read success. Right, we're in there. It's that simple. <laughs> now, these are super cheap ones. They work with super cheap cards. Uh, they do not work. They don't work with bank cards. They won't work with a transit card. They won't work with your, your standard uh, proxy cards that you probably see the most. But that's only because I'm a cheap person and I'm not a bad guy. I'm not like buying these things to actually do anything. So it's just for demonstration purposes only. Um, if you spend a few more bucks, you get one that'll copy that everything I just showed you. It can could, it could copy them and clone them just fine. Well, not the not the payment card, that's a whole different story. NFC's a whole different bug. Our flipper zero. <laughs> it's super, super cool. And it really is a toy. I mean, it is a toy. Remember what I said earlier? So if you guys see me plug something into my computer and then I'm just standing here staring at the screen, uh, it's because I have virtual machines running and they try to take over anything I plug into it. So if you, you guys on the front row especially, if you see me plug something into the computer and then I'm just like, uh, be like, virtual machine, stupid. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Because that's what I just did. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my flipper's name is Flupa. Um, they all have their own name that they come with. Um, I actually changed mine though. Um, but you can see what's on the screen. So what you're seeing up there is literally the same thing that's on my screen right now. 
So we are talking about RFID. So there's apps here. And I'm telling you what, I'm going to skip the whole NFC thing because uh, well, there's so much to cover. Uh, just to put it in a real quick nutshell, NFC is encrypted. It a lot of times actually creates a session between your card and the, the, the transaction people on the other side of things. It's not, you can't just copy them and run around. Flipper Zero will pull credit card numbers off cards though. Um, you can't clone it. You see this stuff on, on TikTok and YouTube. People run around with their Flipper Zero buying stuff. And I'm under the impression that that's fake. I don't think you can actually do that. There might be some people out there that have figured it out, but I don't think so. Uh, the people that program this for, Zipper, for Flipper Zero will say no. Um, so we're skipping all that. Uh, looking at just RFID. The people that wrote the programs here for Flipper Zero, they just pretty much consider everything fuzzing um, for what I'm about to show you. Um, however, there is a difference between fuzzing, brute forcing, um, and dictionary attacks. Um, Flipper Zero considers all of those things to be fuzzing. So fuzzing is where you just shoot random data into a thing and see what happens. Maybe it's not enough data. Maybe it's way too much data. It's, maybe it's just a bunch of, of uh, curse words <laughs> that you shove into it. Uh, you just see what happens. Does it break it or whatever? That's fuzzing. Dictionary attack, you actually have a list of passwords and you go down to list and use it. Brute forcing is doing every single possible character combination that there is. Flipper Zero just calls it all fuzzing. So my uh, device here, like I said, it's super cheap. It's running a M4100 standard RFID. Uh, Flipper Zero will do all of the goodies, uh, your head procs, all of them around. I'm gonna run a full circle here on it. Um, you can run default values. Uh, default values are like the people who made this lock, the people who made I'm sure there's card readers out there in the hallway. The people that made those, there are default values that a lot of companies put in those devices. And if you don't know what you're doing as a security person and you leave them in there, somebody can come along with something like this and run the default values and emulate a card and they're, they're, they're in there. <laughs> um, you can do custom, so you can just put in your own card number and then emulate it with the Flipper Zero. Uh, you can load a file which is created by pulling an RFID card uh, by copying one, um, or you can run your list. Hello? There we go. It's the bunny ears. <laughs> so, uh, this cable is not long enough. So we're gonna lose, lose my screen. So, I forgot which side it was on there for a minute. There we go. So it's basically just running through a bunch of card numbers that was on a text file and seeing if they will work. It's not reading every single time because it's doing like a card number every half second. Two, let's try a different list here. Earlier today I was running through the defaults list and it just popped open. I was like, oh wow, that's neat. There we go. Come on. There we go. Don't know why it wasn't reading uh, a little bit more there, but that's okay. Flipper Zero RFID reading. Does it get any cooler? It does, it gets cooler. So real quick before we wrap up RFID, um, the best RFID reader out there, or the best NFC reader out there that you can get for sure, is, is your phone. It's in your pocket. Uh, it's got, it's got data, uh, data 
exfiltration you can send off to wherever you want. Uh, it's got the NFC reader right there. It's got NFC writer right there. Everything you need is right there. You don't need a Flipper Zero to do havoc with uh, NFC. Uh, from a security perspective, um, general digital security processes come into play here. Um, a lot of the systems here, obviously not my box, uh, not my my box doesn't have a, a full computer running in the background or nothing like that. Uh, there's no access server in the background. Um, but uh, most systems do. You, it's just like uh, rule number two of information security, update, 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 patch, patch, patch. You do that with your security systems. Uh, don't use the defaults. I went over the defaults and how that works. Uh, use a, a second layer, uh, a second layer of security. Second layer can be uh, like multi-factor authentication. It can also be literally a layer. It can literally be a layer of which blocks RFID. So inside here is a covert RFID reader. Uh, every time it beeps, it's reading the card. This is the only card that, that it works with, though. It's the only frequency. Wow, at my house, I can get way further back. I guess there's probably more interference in this room, though. But yeah, my house, I could get like 15 feet back. That's crazy. So you don't have to be close to read somebody's RFID. Get yourself one of these little things right here. And if you don't have a thing like that, I have them for everybody if you want them. <laughs> they come in two shades. You got black and you got gray. And it just so happens that my um, business cards are stuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you know, if you want to check that out too. Okay. Uh, common broadcast radio. That's what these big uh, bunny ears are doing sticking up here. Uh, this is not something that people usually consider whenever they're considering uh, security for their organization. Uh, we're talking AM, FM, uh, citizen band, short band, ham radio. Um, the things that we're going to be looking at are in this little box right here. I told you we're going to get crazy cluttered up here. Things that we're looking at are this uh, RP, uh, uh, SDR dongle. It's already plugged in. I'm not going to mess around with it because <laughs> I don't want it to stop working. Um, but it's already plugged in. Um, it only receives. It's not a transmitter, so you can't do a lot of bad things with it. The only thing I could really think of that you could do bad with it is uh, intercept military, something encrypted from the military or something is the only thing I could think of you could possibly do bad with it. Um, it's really just a toy. And the other thing that we're looking at here, the, the, the battery dying light was showing up at my house before I left earlier. Hopefully we make it. Uh, this is called a hack RF. Um, the SDR dongle can work from 500 kilohertz to 1.75 kilohertz. The hack RF actually works from one uh, megahertz to six gigahertz. So it's uh, much bigger. This, this you can check out uh, Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi and stuff like that with. Um, a hack RF is actually just the circuit board in the back here that has all the radios and stuff on it. Uh, then this front circuit board with the screen is actually a thing called a porta pack. You smash them together, and then I got this cool little case um, to put in. So take a look. Really doesn't matter. Um, actually, there was. When the world shakes, I don't so, if you are at all interested in uh, radio technology, 
type of stuff, I highly suggest getting one of these dongles. Uh, the dongles themselves are 30 bucks, but they sell them in kits for 40 that come with a whole bunch of different antennas because you need a different antenna for different things. Uh, you, they, they have software just for tracking airplanes and listening to the airplane uh, pilots talk. They have stuff to tracking boats. Um, tons of ham radio stuff. So if you're into that, I, I they get one of these dongles and check it out. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's gonna be a little more stable. That's fine. It's all the wireless stuff here. We're gonna get now. He's hacking it like crazy the whole time. Is it maybe because I had the uh, the antenna blocked? Oh, possibly. <laughs> that might have something to do with it. Let's try that then. How's that? Okay. Better? We'll try that. It feel, it's, feels like it's coming in better. Um, maybe just a feeling though. Uh, okay, so, uh, so the SDR Sharp is a great way to learn about broadcast radio. Um, you can see we got, it, it actually lists out the frequency and the meters, and we're looking at FM radio right now. So uh, you can go all the way down. We got shortwave radio, keep going. We got uh, lower band of the ham radio. If we go the other direction from FM, whoop, wrong click. And I didn't realize this, but literally right at the section where FM ends, is where air traffic starts. Um, I believe this is like the encryption, tra encrypted traffic though. You can go all the way up, all the way down. It's so insane. So, let's do a cool little trick here. Before this battery dies. Oh yeah, it's not happy. Might not be able to show this one off. <laughs> no, that one's dead. Oh, wait. Let's try to do it really quick. Okay, we see that see that little sliver there, little sliver of red. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> Is that not crazy? So we are transmitting the frequency in a way that actually paints a picture see uh, on the on the frequency uh, the the time frame you know there's a waterfall showing you the, the time frame of the frequency um, people get really crazy with this there's people out there that they're tweaking it and doing things and making it, it looks like a black and white picture by the time they're done I, I don't have that kind of time in my life but uh, I do for that uh, for for doing it a little bit um, just craziness so don't have to go out and get yourself a big, huge, crazy thing to play around with some FM broadcasting. You can do this little guy. This was like a little $10 soldering kit that I got. I'm glad that battery lasted. <laughs> So, uh, 97.3.
This is a message from the emergency alert system. Please get up from your desk and go outside and look at the thing that is an emergency or whatever. Repeat. This is a message from the emergency alert system. Please get up from your desk and go outside and look at the thing that is an emergency or whatever. The person that stole my antidepressants. I hope you're happy now. US 97. So this will, I mean, it'll, it, you can copy anything that's floating around in the air as long as it's between those frequency ranges. And that's a huge frequency range that this has. Um, so you can copy uh, car fobs. Um, there are plenty of videos out there of thieves that take devices probably this exact type of device, uh, and they stand outside of a, a house in the middle of the night, and they put an antenna and point it at the living room, take another antenna and point it at the car, because they have like a really nice car in the driveway that does keyless entry and keyless st start. So by doing that, the other guy that's with them just hops in the car, starts it, and then they take off, because they're, they're pulling the keyless fob. Um, you can look up on YouTube, there's like 20 videos of people doing this. Um, but you can also, you can copy the key fob, right? Um, key fobs made after 2014, according to the research that I did, after 2014, they do rolling codes. So you can copy the key fob, but whenever you play it back, it won't work anymore, because the code changes, it rolls. Uh, my daughter has my old 2011 VW. And I thought, 2011 is before 2014, so I'm gonna do a really cool demo, I'm gonna record it, uh, people are gonna think I'm super cool, I'm gonna unlock her car with this, and I take her key fob and I copy it, and I go to the door and I hit the button to play the, the transmission back to the car and the, the lights blink on it. Um, and then I'm like, well, I'm gonna do it again. It's, it, it, nothing works anymore. And her key fob is broken now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so sorry, baby girl. <laughs> yeah, that key fob right there is no longer working. Um, the car's still in my name, so, phys so I didn't break any laws. I'm, I'm doing things to, to my own devices. Uh, that's the way you do things for ethical hacking. You use your own devices. You don't do it to other people. But that was so easy to do. Uh, if you were some rascal out there with one of these things, you could just go to Walmart parking lot and just destroy everybody. <laughs> Nobody's car. Nobody can now get in their car anymore because you got one of these dumb little things. Um, I couldn't believe how easy that was to do. I thought it was going to work. I thought I was going to be super cool. But no, not. Instead, I look like an idiot who ruined my daughter's key fob. Oh. Uh, so uh, security uh, perspective for broadcast radio, um, for the most part, for most organizations, it's an extremely low, very low risk. Most people are not concerned with that. Uh, there are people out there, uh, there's a thing called uh, Vapor Trail which you can actually use FM radio to transmit data out of places. Um, but like I said, most organizations, just a USB thing, that's a much bigger fear than that. Um, government intelligence agencies, they're gonna be the ones that are more looking for that, the, like that picture thing that I did. Uh, they're the ones who are gonna be trying to look for that type of stuff more than your average person at your average place. Um, and that's because of the big, big bad boys, the terrorists. Um, they're always looking for ways to move data around. Um, things that you might want to consider at your regular business if you're doing security. Um, the, the fraudulent uh, emergency broadcast system that you see me do, um, police scanner imposters pretending there's a giant police in, uh, involved issue when there's not, uh, walkie talkies. Uh, I envision a thing where you get the security guard to walk back and forth for no reason because you're talking to them, something like that. Um, so there is, there is a little bit of consideration, but for the most part, I just wanted to show off that picture thing. <laughs> this is my show and tell. So, so uh, we got Vic Tomei over there. We got him to get up and go outside to see what the emergency broadcast was all about. While he was out there, we ran over to his computer. and we started poking stuff into it. Cool. 
Where's all my stuff ended up at? Okay, it's coming right back here. Okay. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> be afraid. That's the whole point of these lectures. Be scared. No. Um, so what I just plugged in here, uh, so we snuck in, it's a WID, uh, a wireless human interface device. Uh, this computer doesn't have any idea what I just plugged into it. It thinks it's a, a, a keyboard. And some of you probably worked at jobs maybe where you were not allowed to plug in USBs. How many of you worked at a place where you're not allowed to plug in a keyboard? Nobody, right? We're all allowed to plug in keyboards. As far as this device is concerned, as far as this laptop is concerned, I just plugged in a keyboard and a mouse. It's not a, a USB device. It's not a, it's not a, a USB drive or anything. Um, so this is a key logger. This is also a key logger. Um, back in college, I stripped this down and actually put this inside of a keyboard because me and another uh, college student, we were having a competition to see who could hack each other. And, and, and I won, and he, <laughs> and he does not have very good manners. He was upset about that. <laughs> I caught him standing, like almost standing on top of my computer because I put a padlock on the back so he couldn't open it up and, and, get, and copy my hard drives. And he's like over the top of my computer with it on a chair, <laughs> like bending the metal on my case. And I'm like, dude, we've went too far. We're done. <laughs> So key loggers, again, the computer just thinks it's a, it's a, it's a, just thinks it's one of these. You guys all work in tech, and I'm trying to show you how you plug in a, a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, to show you how extremely simple it is. Uh, it just goes on the end there, something like that, and then that goes on the back of the computer. Um, so if they don't look on the back of their computer, this is on there. But that is a physical attack. And this talk is about wireless. This has a Wi-Fi card inside it, so you can access it remotely. Um, I have a collection of them, and they all break. Like, they last like eight hours, and they cost like 60 bucks. And I don't do this for any particular reason other than it's just fun and playing around, and that's a lot of money to waste. <laughs> so I'm not buying any more wireless key loggers. They're ridiculous. Um, they come in different shapes and sizes. All of these are broke, so I can't do a live demo for you. This, as you can tell, only has, only has one side. It's not two sides. Um, this is programmable. You can program drivers into it to turn it into a screen, turn it into a speaker, turn it into whatever you want. Uh, the, like this one is programmed to be a, uh, mount, a hard drive, and, I mean, a keyboard and mouse combo is what that one's programmed as. This one I bought for super, super cheap, and I've never got my computer to recognize it. It just will not show up. <laughs> so uh, if you guys want to check these out, you can. You, you guys up front if you want to. This has a little bitty, uh, there's a Wi-Fi antenna that's extremely small. I literally have it taped on there because I just use it just to demo. Um, so feel free to look at it, but please don't take the tape off. That, that poor little Wi-Fi antenna is going to drop off at any moment now. Um, but yeah, feel free to pass that around and check it out. Like I said, they're all broken, so don't try to jack it from me because it don't work. <laughs> um, anything you can... <laughs> if you do take it and you get it to work, then that's cool. Let me know how you did that. Um, so physical access, uh, if you haven't noticed, there's kind of a theme here whenever I'm on the, the thing with the, the, the slide with the pictures, I like to do a demo. Um, but uh, so that key logger was working two days ago and it just recently out on me. It's, it's gone. It's not working anymore. I cannot get it to connect. Um, so I have a failed live demo slide here. <laughs> uh, the way that the, the key logger works is you log into it. It creates a wireless network. You log into that wireless network, and you can then download the, the logs from the keys that it has, that it has recorded. Um, you can also set it up. Did my voice stop? Uh, you can also set it up to do an FTP server. So like at a specific time, it'll send a, a, the logs to an FTP server. Um, these are all things that I got to work pretty easily. The only thing I never got to work was the email. Um, supposedly, you could set it up to 
connect to a, a wireless access that has internet and then it would send email to you. Those, I've never got those to work with, with these things. So what we're doing is we're pretending that I had a key logger and we got this guy's password. Okay, so we got his password um, by tricking him to go outside to see the thing that was an emergency. And when he did that, we plugged in the keylogger, then we got his password. We also plugged in the WID. It's actually called a WID cactus is what that one's called. Um, and you can now We can log in to that WID cactus remotely and the computer it's connected to has no idea any of that is happening. And it's, uh, you can see it right there. It's just a little bitty tiny thumb drive. It's not a full-fledged router access point thing, so it's kind of slow. <laughs> it takes it a while to figure out that you're trying to connect to it. Plus it knows I'm in the middle of a lecture and wants to make it, wants to make me look bad. Here we go. So we are literally looking at what's on that right now. Uh, this is the graphical user interface that's on that WID right now. Um, you can go to input mode here and actually send keystrokes straight from your computer to there. So it's basically anything that you can do while you're setting on a keyboard, you can now do remotely from wherever you want. Um, I am not going to dig into to clicking these buttons and doing that because there's something way cooler that I want to show off here. There are payloads. Basically, this is a script. It runs Arduino code. Uh, it's, I think it's kind of a mixture between Ducky and Arduino code kind of a thing. Um, but it tells, uh, it tells it what buttons to press. Um, so if you can zoom in, you want to zoom into that computer right there. I'm sorry, you guys in the back but you definitely want to see this screen on this computer right here. Because one click, it logged in with his password. Put my hands in there so you know that I'm not typing. <laughs> it is pulling up a, a Windows run command. Something's not right. I literally did this like 300 times at home and I do it in front of you guys. That's okay. I have it doing two different things. So maybe it'll do the last thing. I'm gonna blame my sister for setting up the laptop. It's your fault. <laughs> we'll make it talk. Yeah, that's weird. So it didn't do half the stuff it's supposed to do. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, if you notice, there never was any Windows Defender popped up there. We're, we were poking around on the computer. We logged into it with the password, um, all from remote. N nothing, there's, there's no RDP turned on, and this is fully updated Windows uh, computer. So it's pretty dangerous. Man, I wish it really would have done what it's supposed to do. So uh, I actually had it do text-to-speech, and at the end it said, hey, you're hacked. Uh, it would have been so cool. That's okay though. We got plenty of cool stuff to go to. Um, so security perspective for physical access devices. Uh, basically, you're just looking at insider threats. That's what we're looking at here. Um, you wanna do see something, say something, and whistleblower policies and training. 
Um, very clear security policies are important whenever we're talking about uh, insider threats. You want your employees to know where they're allowed to be, when they're allowed to be there, where they're not allowed to be, and when they're not allowed to be there. Um, that way you can see uh, when something goes awry, you can tell. Uh, it's very obvious. Um, secure offboarding, offboarding and uh, terminating process, background checks, those are all important things. Uh, one thing I like to point out here that I don't think a lot of companies even consider whenever you're thinking about insider threat, you should think about your employee's mental health. Um, employee assistant programs I think are very important when it comes to thinking about keeping your company safe from your own employees doing something bad. Um, if you have employees that are broke, ain't got enough money to buy food, they're way more likely to do something bad to your company. If you have uh, uh, people that they're, they're just having a bad time in their life, you know, they're, they're way more likely to do bad things whenever they're in a bad mental state. So employee assistant programs, I think, are very important when it comes to insider threat, and I'll, I'll stop hammering on that one. <laughs> but uh, uh, wireless environment audits and third-party penetration tests, those are always important whenever you're talking about physical security. See if a stranger can get from the street to the laptop to plug in a device and then fail on their live demo. <laughs> So uh, that brings us to the big boy, the big boy in radio communications. We're talking about Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi is vulnerable. There's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> you can make it harder to get into for sure, um, but you really, there's a vulnerability in WPA3. There's one in, there's multiple in WPA2 and WEP, which is 20 some years old, shouldn't even be used anymore, but people are still using it. And I have proof of that at the end of the lecture here. Uh, so the main things that we're talking about, we're talking about hacking Wi-Fi that most people are talking about, the common hacks, we're talking about gaining access to the network. Um, those can be done through like Mac spoofing, turning your computer into a trusted device on the network, um, exploiting the vulnerabilities that there are in the Wi-Fi protocols. Um, social engineering, just getting people to give you access, give you the password. Uh, the other common talk whenever you're talking about hacking Wi-Fi as we're talking about just breaking the system. Uh, you can do that by sending deauthorization packets, um, by doing Mac flooding, which is basically Mac spoofing, except for you're doing it like a thousand times a minute, a thousand times a second uh, with different Mac addresses. Um, very simple to do and you shut down a whole network with that. Um, so let's move on. Um, Wi-Fi hacking toys. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate any Wi-Fi hacking with the uh, Flipper Zero, uh, but I am gonna do this little, I don't wanna touch it because I'm afraid it's gonna come unhooked in the middle of my demo. Um, we got a external uh, Wi-Fi card. Those are needed because you need to be able to monitor the traffic. Um, see, I told you I had one. But after Pedaling around with this thing for like six hours yesterday, I decided it was not something I was gonna plug in and try to show a room full of people because it won't do anything. Um, it used to do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, talking about the deauthorization and kicking people off of the network, this is a watch that will do that. It's like that simple. Uh, it sends deauthorization packets. You can target networks or you can just turn it on and let it do it like crazy. Turning deauthorization, deauthorizing networks and clients that you don't have permission to do is illegal, don't do that. <laughs> um, but like I said, you can actually pick your target with, a, with, those, with that watch. So it has a little bit of security analyst clout. Um, we are going to hack a WEP network. I hope this one works. Um, not gonna go over the uh, how the WEP network has a vulnerability. I mean, it has to do with uh, flooding the network with uh, initiation vectors through uh, uh, ARP calls. Um, and I don't want to jump into all that detail because I want to do the actual hack here. Oop, wrong one. So, First, we want to check our interface and make sure that we have one and that it is being seen. Uh, next, we want to actually turn it on and put it into monitor mode. So uh, like all operating systems, there's a, a, a network 
uh, network management system going on in Kali, just like there is in pretty much all operating systems, um, it's a good idea to kill that whenever you're not using it and you're doing other things here. So checking it. Okay, it's showing that we are in So first thing we got to do is actually uh, sniff the traffic in the air, and this is why I told Levi we were we don't need to record this because I don't know what it's going to show or not. We don't need to do it live. Is what I'm saying. We, can, we 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 are recording, but we'll edit it later. Um, this is the part that I was talking about that we probably want to edit out. Uh, So either there is no Wi-Fi traffic in this area right now, or my card's not working. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> I figured there'd be some smart guy in the back who's like, there's probably no Wi-Fi traffic. Yeah, there he is. On. Be nice, be nice. There we go. So there is, there is Wi-Fi traffic. Oh, maybe there wasn't Wi-Fi traffic a few minutes ago, and uh, everything just, that, that's what happened. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I'm not an idiot. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's all the Wi-Fi traffic going on here. Uh, we're trying to hack a WEP network, and all I'm seeing is WPA2. So uh, what's going on is there's so much traffic in the area right now that we're not able to see the one network that I'm trying to target. Um, that's okay though. Because we can filter it. There it is. This might not work because there is a lot of Wi-Fi traffic in here. Um, so. Uh, I can kill this now because I found the thing that we're trying to target here. Uh, so we found a network called WEP-Hackwoods. Remember my organization's Hackwoods Academy? So that I own that. It's that device right there from the 90s with the purple around it there. Uh, you guys that are old enough, you had one of those. I guarantee you had one of those. We had like three or four in our house. This is my sister here back in the 90s. Um, so. The important thing that you need to get from why you're why you're sniffing the traffic is because you need to get the uh, the MAC address from the access point, and you need to get the channel. So uh, looking up here, we're on channel six, and we have a BSS ID right here. And I can copy this, but I've actually done these commands enough that it's probably saved in my um, bash history. So Let's see, there we go. Um, so there's a program called B-Sides NG, and it will just straight hack WEP. Um, at home, I, I got it down to like 32 seconds. Um, I've had it take 10 minutes before, though. So let's see what happens here. It's going to say, let's ride. <laughs> yeah. Oh, holy crap. There's no way. Did I already have a... <laughs> okay. That was interesting. It did it. <laughs> like really fast. So 
So what may have happened, I may have already had this file here from doing this demo at home. Um, but anyway, you run that, uh, like I said, I've had it down 37 seconds before. I've never had to do that fast, so that file was already there. Um, what, what the B-Sides NG does is it creates a log file and then it captures, uh, it, it, it stuffs the uh, network full of uh, initiation vectors that, it, that then you can use to get the password. Um, WEP encrypts its traffic with initiation vectors smashed together with the passphrase. So that's why you take the initiation vectors and you just cram it full uh, until some super smart people figured out how to get the password um, out of there if you have enough initiation vectors in your data. Um, so what you do from here, we're gonna do some crack, some air crack in G. I worry that this might already be done too, but that's okay. Yeah, that this is what it looks like uh, whenever you're doing it. Um, it normally takes a few seconds, but uh, you can see that it's it's ran all its calculations and with all of the initiation vectors that it's stuffed. And we have a password here. Uh, you can ignore the, the semicolons. 417-876-001 is the password. So we go right ahead. We will forget our exploit there. While that's connecting, I'm gonna do a real quick. So these are the files that I did at home practicing this demo uh, just to prove The, this demo is real. Let's remove all this stuff so we can do it from scratch. Okay, so now we have an empty doc. doc. This is for the, the next live demo. I'm not gonna go and walk through and do the WEP thing all, all again. Um, so we are connected now. So that was the correct password. If we go check out our network drive, we see that there's another computer. We're on a network with another computer. That's our, our victim A over there. Uh, we also can see we have access to a network drive, which is just the thumb drive stuck in the back of that router over there. Maybe, maybe we do. Somebody like running something in here to de auth stuff <laughs> <laughs> or anything? <laughs> I know, I was gonna say, am I, am I running something? No, I'm not. Okay. The reason why I'm asking is because, um, so the watch that I have that I just checked to make sure was turned off, uh, so that's okay. So there's some, did somebody else log into this? <laughs> uh, that's okay. So there's, there's a network drive that, that you can access. Not a big deal, not a really big part of the demo. We don't gotta dig, dig into that, um, but this is what I'm seeing here. And that's a thing that that watch has the ability to do. The watch that I showed you, that's why I wanna make sure it was turned off. Um, it'll just fill, it'll just fill uh, any place in range with a bunch of crazy looking access points like that. Um, I'm not running anything that's doing that. So somebody somewhere is doing something funky. <laughs> just wait like 20 minutes, uh, I'll be down here. Um, okay. 
So that's WEP hacking. I'm gonna jump straight into the WPA2 real fast because we're gonna run out of time if I don't. So again, the exact same thing that we would do before. So there's way too much MSU stuff going on in here. Uh, we're gonna just fake it and pretend that I found the access point because uh, it should all be saved in here anyway. So we don't need to we don't need to put every single uh, MSU access point up on the screen <laughs> for Levi to have to edit out later. So what this command is doing, uh, we're, we're running that arrow dump again and creating a, a dump file. Uh, we are on channel one, hopefully it's still on channel one, uh, and the BSSID there, that's the BSSID for the little router here, not the 90s one, but the actual little one here. Let's put it up here like that. You two are in big trouble. <laughs> what is it? Couldn't access the network drive because the router's not plugged in. <laughs> I'm just, you're not in big trouble. That's how you really That's how you keep stuff secure. That's how you keep your, your, your wireless access point secure is you just unplug them. It's fine. It's fine. And that would also be the reason why it wasn't showing up in our my traffic thing is because it wasn't plugged in. That's super funny. I have a checklist here of stuff to do for this lecture and uh, plugging in the router wasn't on there. <laughs> Bringing the router, but not plugging it in. So let's just for kicks, let's see if it'll even show up yet. So hopefully when it comes online, we'll be able to see it here. <laughs> I can't wait to, it's like a couple months from now when I'm telling somebody about this lecture. There we go, see it's online, WPA2 Hackwoods. I'll be like, yeah, I was in a room full of like 50 people and they're all standing me, uh, watching me on stage and I'm trying to hack this uh, router and it's not plugged in. <laughs> I appreciate you guys not stealing my stuff. This is a little bit of thing here. So there we go. So we're online. Um, so the router's turned on. Um, but in order to hack uh, WPA2 networks, you have to grab a handshake. And a handshake happens whenever a client talks to the access point. So at the current moment, we just have a router turned on. There's nobody connected to it. So we don't have, uh, there's no way we're gonna connect, we're, we're gonna grab a handshake out of the air if there's nobody talking to it. Uh, so I'm gonna connect to it with my phone here. If something was already connected, you could send a deauthorization packet and it would kick them offline, they would immediately jump back online. Um, but there's nobody online to, to kick off, so. Yeah. And watch how fast this happens. So I'm gonna click the connect button now. Bam, handshake. Took it right out of the air. Now this handshake is not, you have not hacked the Wi-Fi. Um, all you've done is you've just gathered the information that you need to compare the correct password. 
So if you have the right password, you can compare it to your handshake and you can see that you have the right password. Um, so this means uh, you're not trying to log into the network a thousand times a second um, trying to brute force it. You're just brute forcing the file. Um, you can take it anywhere in the world, that file, and, and figure it out uh, on your own. Uh, so if we take a look at what that did, created a log file, it created a capture file just like the, uh, um, just like the WEP file. Um, so this is a good point to make here. If you have a weak password, this is where the weak passwords get you because uh, it's so easy to grab that capture file, go home, and if your password's one, two, three, they could figure it out like that. And now if your password is 12 characters or more, a bunch of random characters, it's gonna take them years. By the time they figure out what that password is, if they ever do in their entire life, um, you're probably not gonna have that access point anymore. So this is where strong uh, passwords come into play. Um, what we're gonna do, uh, a little bit of a live demo uh, tomfoolery, uh, is we're gonna pretend that we did some uh, recon on Vic Tomei here. Uh, we have discovered that they use weak passwords. Uh, we discovered that they use phone numbers. Uh, we figured out that they use uh, Springfield local phone numbers. So we know that it's 417, we know it's 10 digits, and we know that they're all numbers. Uh, we did a little more recon and we overheard the ladies talking and they were like, why are the passwords always phone numbers that start with an eight? So now we know that it's 4178 and it's 10 characters long, they're all numbers. So we've done enough recon for that. Like I said, this is live demo uh, tomfoolery because in real life, you would have a month to crack a password if you really, really, really wanted it. In a demo, I've got uh, not a month. <laughs> we know, uh, so we know what it most likely is. So we create a list. What's going on with that mic there? Um, a really cool tool in Kali to make brute forcing lists is a thing called Crunch. Um, so you can make it, uh, the program takes a set of parameters, two numbers at the beginning, the minimum length and the maximum length of the list of passwords that you're trying to create. So if you were to do like, you just are doing a minimum of two characters and a maximum of three characters, and uh, the characters A, A, B, D, I accidentally typed D instead of C, and it will do it like this. And now you can see we have every single possible character using the ABD starting with two and three. So back to our uh, victim A's system here, um, a phone number, we know it's gonna have a minimum of 10 characters, it's gonna have a maximum of 10 characters, so we put 10, 10. Um, Crunch has a thing where it allows you to put in a, a pattern for, for the, uh, the output. Um, so we're putting in uh, hyphen T, is for what comes next as a pattern. Uh, whatever characters you put in will stay there unless they're special characters. So we have the 417, and the special character that Crunch recognizes as a number is the percent sign. So we got 4178, number, 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 and then we're gonna output that into a thing called number list. And uh, it's really fast, and it's not going to show as the output like it did last time because it outputted it to a file. But if you really want to see it, you can cat it and see there's every single possible combination of 4178. 4178 something. Uh, 41784 and five and six. So on all the way up to 9999999 right there. So we're gonna do some crack again. Arrow crack and NG. So we're taking the, the capture file that I showed you. We got really fast from the phone connecting. Uh, we're gonna match it up against the number list that we just did. And it looks very to the WEP hacking like that. So you can see there in the middle how it's going through the current phase, uh, current pass phrase, and, and matching it with the, uh, uh, with the capture file, with the capture data to see if it's correct or not. Um, we're gonna let that run and move on because this is gonna take a little while, but it's, it's doable within the lecture time. Um, 
we will check back on that. Uh, so the longest it possibly could take, what, seven minutes is what it's telling us here. So a security perspective for WP and WPA2, uh, for WEP and WPA2. Um, first off, WEP, I kind of cheated because I had some of the files already saved in the background, but even if I didn't, maximum six minutes and you're in a WP network. Don't use WP network, just don't use it, period. It came out in 1997. Um, it's, the hack has been out since 2001. Don't use it. And you, I, I'm talking to you guys like, like uh, and you guys are probably thinking in your head, I'm not using it, shut up. Um, but uh, there are people that are using it in Springfield <laughs> right now. <laughs> Just don't, you, why are they using it? You can literally click a button, it's a click button hack. Um, so other than not using WEP, uh, use the strong passwords. Obviously don't use 10 character phone numbers. You're gonna see how easy that is to get into here in any second. Um, don't use anything predictable. Don't use the year, don't use birthdays, don't use child and pet names. Um, use all types of characters. Um, segment your network. Uh, if you're working at a company and you're the network architect guy or anybody in that area, um, if you have departments that use different resources and they don't access the same resources, they need to be on different networks. That's just basic security. Um, if you need a guest network, create a guest network. If you have anything public facing, put it in a DMZ. Use WPA3 when possible. And I'm talking WPA3 and then WPA3 only. If you're using WPA3 and WPA32, you're not using WPA3, you're using WPA2. Uh, as far as a hacker is concerned, because they just downplay. The, they just downgrade attack, and they're, they're in there just like they could if it was WPA2. So I would like to do the research and see if it's even possible to really have a fully, like a, a fully enterprise network that's using WPA3. Uh, it's been around since 2017. That's plenty of time for, for the devices to be out there, but nobody's really doing it. <laughs> uh, not many people are really doing it. Does anybody here work in a place that is 100% WPA3 protocol and that's it? That's what I'm saying. It, and it's a way stronger um, uh, protocol. You can't send deauthorization packets to a WPA3 network. Um, you can't grab a shake like that in a WPA3. Um, but there's, there's gotta be a reason. Maybe they don't make the devices. That's why I would like to do the research on it. Like pretend you had money was on an issue you can build whatever network you want. Could you build a network that's 100% WPA3 protocol? I'd like to answer that question someday, maybe next lecture. So uh, two more sections here in 10 minutes. Let's get through this one really fast. Uh, evil portholes, that's whenever uh, you have somebody who's uh, pretending to be a wireless access point that they're not. Um, I'm just gonna jump right into live demo in that one because I don't wanna run out of time. I really wanna hit the very last section here. Oh, whoops. Chill out there, Flipper. So if you, uh, does anybody have a uh, Flipper Zero? Yeah? Well, were you the guy doing the thing with all yeah, the access? Uh, access? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I like Extreme better than, Mar uh, oh wait, Marauder is just for the, just, yeah, I have Marauder on here, that's what we're gonna look at, sorry. I was thinking uh, there's Rogue Master as the firmware, and then there's Extreme, and I use Extreme. That seems to be the easiest one to get going. Um, but yeah, so if you're doing any kind of Wi-Fi uh, stuff with a Flipper Zero, you gotta get a dev board. It's got all the Wi-Fi-ness. All the Wi-Fi-ness is right in, you can see it right in there. Okay. This one, this one is super simple. Um, if you guys trust me, you can participate in this one if you want to. Like I said, if you trust me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying it nicely. I said just say, hey, stupid. Do you, yeah, virtual machines. Virtual. I told you I did that. I do that all, all the time. 
So this is uh, the, what you're seeing on that screen is what is on my screen right here. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much over there. Uh, I knew I'd forget it too. All right, so we go to Wi-Fi. This is a super easy demo at home. It was anyway. All we gotta do is click start. Okay, cool, 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 it's working. Like I said, feel free to participate in this one if you want to, if you trust me. I promise you there's nothing going on with this, this access point. It's a, a, however, if you do participate, do not type in your real credentials. Don't type in your real email. Don't type in your real password. <laughs> Uh, but if you go, if you pull out your phone and you pull out and you, um, it's an open network called Hackwood's free Wi-Fi. It's free Wi-Fi for you. And if you connect to it, are you seeing it already? It might not do it for me if there's other people already in there, so. So uh, yeah, so I don't really need to, okay, there it goes, finally. So yeah, it immediately pulls up and it's like, hey, this is Google, please log in. Um, whatever you type in there, like I said, don't put in your, <laughs> don't put in any of your real credentials. Uh, whatever you put in there is gonna show up here. I will see we got clients connected. So my creds, totally info. That's not a real email address, there's no at in there. <laughs> So uh, you, anything that does uh, monitoring type of, of Wi-Fi can create it an, an, an evil portal. Uh, security uh, perspectives, things to think about. I'm gonna go ahead and make this big here because I don't have any more live demos. No, there's, there's more toys in here, but the, no more live stuff. Um, so things to consider whenever we're talking about uh, evil portals and uh, is check out the URL. Although if you notice on the evil portal that I just made, the URL actually said secure connect at android.com, uh, those can be faked too. Uh, but a lot of times they, they are not faked and they look cruddy. Uh, look for awkward looking logos, look for awkward looking fonts. This is a big sign. Look for, th if it's asking you for things that it normally doesn't ask you, like when does Google ask you for your uh, service provider? Um, and then if there's links on there that don't work, you know, forgot your password, you click on a link and it doesn't go anywhere, you might be on a bad network. Um, you might be on a fake one. Um, there's a thing called, uh, I really have to hit on this, I'm gonna go a little over eight. Uh, I think it's kind of important to hit on, the turning off your Wi-Fi thing. So evil portals, there's a, another thing called a twin porthole. That is where they actually take a portal and they copy it exactly. Um, so people go to Starbucks, they copy that Starbucks uh, access point, exactly. The exact same name, the exact same password. Now, anybody who has connected to that one in the past your phone, all of our phones do it, it connects automatically. So now they create a clone of that access point and so not all phones, some phones are smart and don't do it, um, but most phones will just see that network and go, hey, I know you, I was on you the other week and you're a thousand miles away from that Starbucks, but you're connected to the, the clone. Uh, so you wanna, if you, if you are using Starbucks and, and hotels and things like that, delete, delete it when you're done. Um, or turn your Wi-Fi off and your Bluetooth too whenever you're not using it walking around. Um, those are important things. A lot of people think that evil portals don't have internet access. That's not true either. You, these things have two antennas on them. One of them can be the one connecting to your computer. The other one can be a tunnel to an internet. So you might be thinking, I'm surfing the internet. I'm good. This is a real portal, but it's, it's not. Um, things to think about. Uh, best way to knock out the last one, but I feel like the last one is very important. Um, so war driving. War driving is where you take a device, I'm not demoing anything, it's just that important that I show you in my hand. <laughs> Take a device, any type of device, and you travel around with it, and you just collect all the data that you can. Um, you can war drive with a flipper, you can war drive with your phone, you can war drive with anything, with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Um, this device, on the other hand, has all the things. Um, this has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, GPS, 
um, GSM cellular network so it can track cell phone towers and tell you where cell phone towers are at. Um, I plugged this in and I drove around Springfield for two hours. And this is the result. Two hours, I got over 30,000 devices. Granted, a lot of these are gonna be uh, duplicates. So even with duplicates, 15,000. It's a lot of devices out there. Um, if we sort, so I had a whole thing I was gonna say before we got to this section, but we're already deep into the section. I was gonna say if you were worried and scared before we got here, yeah, here we go. <laughs> this, gets, this, is, this is the bad part. Uh, remember how easy WEP was to crack? So uh, here's Springfield, Missouri. Oh, by the way, don't take pictures <laughs> with your phone. If anybody's, the, the, this part will be edited out of the video. Do not take pictures. Uh, this is kind of, sen this is sensitive material. Uh, look at all these that are using WEP. And this was January 10th of this year. Crazy, crazy. We go to these places and be like, yo man, you need to stop that. Um, this row right here, this is, latitude, one of them's latitude and one of them's longitude. So it actually tells you exactly where these spots are at. Crazy, right? <laughs> um, but you might be thinking, okay, well, Chris, all you're doing is just, you're just showing us where access points are located at and that they exist. What's the big deal? The big deal is this cute little guy. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is a Ponagachi. Um, those of you from the 90s remember the little pets called Tamagotchis that you had to feed? And you clicked a little button to feed them. And if you didn't feed them, they would die. He does the same thing. See, he's sad because he hasn't been fed much. Um, he hasn't been fed much because I changed his configuration because I don't want to be doing things illegal. <laughs> I, I'm in this for, I'm the good guy here. Um, we'll get into that. So uh, what a, a Ponagachi does is remember all those steps that I just did to capture a handshake? Oh, by the way, I'm sure that's cracked by now, right? Yeah, so that's cracked. You see our, our key here. So uh, Ponagachi, which is, it, it's right here. This is the actual Ponagachi that you're seeing on the screen there. It's right here. Um, mine's a goth one. He's got the black screen. He's all blacked out. Um, uh, but what I'm getting at is all those steps that we walk through on the computer to get that handshake, this does it all by itself. All you have to do is plug in a power supply and it does all those steps to every network within range as fast as it possibly can like a crazy maniac. Um, the people who make this, uh, they haven't really updated their GitHub in probably about five years, but there are, are a whole community of people out there that are updating it on their own. Um, the people who made this, I don't think that they're very security savvy. I don't think, I, to be honest, I don't think they're in it for the right reasons. Um, they don't make any money off of it because you just download the thing and buy a Raspberry Pi is how you make it. So it's not like it goes to the people that, that, that made it. Um, and the reason I say I don't think they're in it for the right reasons is because if you follow their directions, you, uh, you download the firmware, you throw it on an SD card, you pop it in a Raspberry Pi, and that's all you have to do to make one of these. Um, you can buy a screen and print the thing and add the antenna and do all that if you want. But all you have to do is get a Raspberry Pi uh, 0 W and pop an SD card in it and you've got one of these. Um, if you just follow their directions, it will, it will, if it can't associate with a network, it'll start kicking things off the network, which I've mentioned earlier is illegal. We don't do that. That's bad. You don't mess with people's network like that. Don't kick clients off. That's bad. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in making one of these and checking them out, do your research, read all the documentation. You need to go into the configuration file and actually add a line to it that says, um, I don't know the exact syntax, but it's personality, dauth, false. <laughs> that way you have one like this that you can plug in and show everybody and not be worried about you know, uh, FBI tracking you down or anything because you're going around knocking their, their network off. Uh, but it also, it's designed, it's designed to be bad. And if you don't let it kick things off, it gets sad because it's, it's not eating the handshakes. It's like, I want to be mean. Why are you not being mean? Um, so I, I have a nice four acres at my house. I can turn this on and I might get the, the feed store next door every now and then. Please don't, don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, 
But besides them, I'm out of range from most people. Um, and I seriously doubt, they're so far away, I seriously doubt I'm really kicking anything off. So I can actually go in and turn the D off on it and test these things. I can test a lot of these things where I live at without really affecting anybody. Um, and it gets really happy. So you can see down here at the bottom. Oh, so actually it's really sad right now because it's in, it's in, uh, it's in manual mode. It's not doing anything right now. <laughs> Um, but you can see that since this device has been turned on, it's pwned 24 networks. Um, I meant to turn that on during the lecture and we would see, because normally in a couple hours it would get three or four things. Um, but if you put these two things together, the war driver and this, you're like this close to like hacking half your city. So, uh, especially if you live in a smaller place like Springfield, like that close. So you guys are all in IT. Take all the things that you've just heard me say, harden your network, harden it, because it's only gonna get worse. People are making freaking toys that hack Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, with that, I skipped quite a few things here. Uh, real quickly, the uh, security perspective for war driving is if you're not using it, turn it off. Uh, you don't need the most powerful Wi-Fi in the world. You just need Wi-Fi large enough to cover your area. People don't seem to get that. They just want, turn up the Wi-Fi, boost it as much as possible. Then you're sharing it with the street. You're sharing it with the guy next door who you're giving them a potential to, their Ponagachi's gonna get you. Um, and use strong passwords. Uh, with that, thank you. I'm five minutes over, sorry about that. Um, that was a lot, that was a lot of stuff that I went through. I, I, I'm, a couple things messed up, but other than that. Um, questions, do I have to do questions, Levi? <laughs> All right, be, be easy on and me. And I will come around with a mic <laughs> if you have a question. Okay, hold on one second, let me bring you the mic. So it shows up in the recording. Uh, testing, okay, cool. I'm kind of curious, but with the uh, Marauder, have you already tested the part where you can actually, if anyone has Bluetooth on either Samsung or I think uh, Apple, you can like basically. I could do it right now. Oh, that works. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, wouldn't recommend it, but if you want to crash someone's phone, I'm curious. Um, it doesn't really do, it, to be honest, it doesn't. So iPhone had an update and it doesn't really do iPhones too much. This is the funniest part. So, so I have a big pile of cell phones at home, right? Uh, and my, my daughter, I, I did her phone the other day uh, and she's like, I don't even know what you're doing. And I'm like, look at your Bluetooth. She's like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff trying to connect to it. Um, so yeah, it, it's not as effective as they make it look like in the YouTube shorts and stuff. Um, and the crazy thing is, so I have a, a it seems to really only, from my, my, from my playing around with it, only work on actual Samsung, Samsung phones. Um, not working on Android. Uh, it wasn't working on iPhone last time I tried it. Um, but this is a Samsung made from Samsung. And if I do that, this phone becomes useless. It's just constantly saying Bluetooth headphones, Bluetooth headphones, Bluetooth headphones, Bluetooth headphones. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty neat one. I, I'm surprised it's taken them so long to update it. Do you know why it's that installed was on this stuff? Created though, like I'm honestly just curious. I feel like it's more of a, a troll. Uh, like, was there actually any use for for like pen testing or hacking wise? Just teaching people to turn off their Bluetooth when they're not using it, really. Um, the, no, they're real. I, see, that's, I, 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 I didn't even think about demoing it because there's not a lot of usefulness to that. Um, Bluetooth is a uh, Bluetooth is a really complicated thing to hack. Uh, people think that it's not, but it's because it, 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 it constantly changes channels, constantly. Um, so if you noticed every one of the, the hacks I did, we had to put in a channel. Uh, that's just usually the way hacks work. Bluetooth, that's not happening. And you don't know where the next channel is. So the, those type of hacks aren't gonna work on Bluetooth. Um, yeah, the usefulness of, of, of the, the BLE spam is what they call it. I don't really know, yeah. That's, and, and we are really getting into an error of, of ethical hacking versus like, you have your bad guys that are obviously bad guys and you have your ethical hackers like myself who, are, or, who just love doing this stuff and poking around on things. Um, but there's this like weird, weird world that's emerging where uh, the Ponagachi, like why in the world would you, nobody who's just doing information security would make a thing like that. Um, it's super useful because it does all of the pen testing for you. 
Um, but why would you put a crazy face on it? Why would you make it do that? There's this weird world of like people that are just hacking stuff and they don't care uh, if they're doing good or bad. And this is weird. The, the Flipper Zero, it's a dolphin. Like what? what that, those things wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. And it's really weird that that's, that's coming up. Like the BLE spam, like there, there's, I, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, no, there's no use for that <laughs> in pen testing. They're really, the only use for it is to show people to turn off their Bluetooth. That's really it because it crashes phones. Um, I didn't mean to ramble on on that, but uh, yeah, any other questions? Do you only make payments in cash now? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so I actually use, uh, uh, I use the, the tap and go the most. Um, that's actually the most, the most secure. Um, I've had my card copied, cloned before at Wendy's. Um, you just don't let people walk off with your card. I learned that right then and there. Uh, well, I learned that two days later, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the tap and go, it is way more harder to hack. Um, the tap and go actually changes the chip. It, it changes a little bit of the data on the chip um, each time. So you can't just copy it and run around doing tap and go. Um, it actually like creates a really quick session with the whole network and all this. It's just definitely the, the most secure is, is that tapping um, versus the other one. But I will say what's gonna happen in the future, um, remember uh, skimmers uh, where the people attach the thing and then you, you slide your card and it copies it to a little chip on the inside, the, the card skimmers that were all in the news, they're doing it to gas pumps like crazy. Um, I will say the next phase of that um, so that tap and go, the only way you can hack it is to put a device in the middle. So it's reading what's going on on the reader and it's reading what's going on with your card at the same time. So it can sync up with that data that's constantly changing. So I would say, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we have uh, skimmers that are tap and go skimmers where they cover it up and it actually captures that data from both sides. Because that's the only way to hack the tap and go, and people are gonna hack your credit cards, man. <laughs> they're gonna steal your cash in your pocket too, so they're always gonna come for your money. <laughs> uh, did I answer that one good? Am I doing good with questions? I was worried about questions. <laughs> I, this is what I was worried about before you asked your question. I was worried as gonna be like, can I take questions? And you guys are gonna be like, how many times have you been in jail? <laughs> Why do you do this? Like, I, that's what I was afraid the questions were going to be. I'm glad that they're not. I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead. just trying to make Levi run around. Uh, <laughs> Another person over here? <laughs> no, I got a, um, a question about you. You had the um, uh, longitude and latitude. Is that triangulating that, or is that just on the router? Like, is that data on the router? Um, it's using the GPS. So this has a GPS okay. chip in so it. So it's it's yeah. wherever so, that was when it read that. Yeah, so it's so um, it's telling you where this was at at the moment that it discovered that network. Gotcha. So it's not going to pinpoint it, but it also tells you the signal strength at the moment that it detected it. So, you can so if it's a really strong signal strength, you know you were close. If it's really weak, then your longitude, latitude, then you know that you're in the area. So. And then I had another one that's, that maybe you don't know. Um, uh -huh. With the Ponagachi and how they use the um, Pi Zero, do you, it. <laughs> do you know why they picked a Pi instead of maybe an Arduino? Or No, I, don't have, I wouldn't have any idea gotcha. at all, yeah. Just yeah, the, that, that, that's actually, it's actually an older project that's just kind of picked up steam here recently. Yeah, like I said, the guys who started it, they haven't updated it in like five years. And, they ha and the thing about, the, the reason I, I kind of have a dislike for those guys is because if you go look at their GitHub issues, they have issues where people like put up an issue where they're like, I don't want this to attack every network in the world. Can we make it so that it doesn't do that? And they ignore those issues. And then there's other issues where it's like, I would like to use this type of crazy screen. And they're all over that one. <laughs> like they are not interested in making it a actual tool. They just made this weird crazy thing that eats uh, handshakes and that's, they're done with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe because how much are Arduinos uh, with Wi-Fi built in? I feel like they're way cheaper than Pi. The problem is Arduinos are packet controllers, and they don't have much ROM in them, so you can't store large programs or do complex processing inside of them. Oh, okay. 
So it has to do it has to do with the the, the processor works better, I guess is what, what I'm getting here. Thank you. <laughs> um, side note: with all those WP WEP networks that you found, that's got to be someone's grandma here. Can you like check in on her, <laughs> make sure her router's up to date, all that kind of stuff? She probably wants you to say hi, anyways. Just saying. Okay, who's next? I think you. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you struggled finding like a good wireless hot plug tool. I was just curious if you'd played around with like the Hack Five OMG stuff. No, those are too expensive. Okay. <laughs> those yeah. are yeah, those that's... are crazy expensive. What are they like a hundred bucks for a USB cable? Yeah. Just so uh, yeah. you can just so I mean now now um, my goal in life is to eventually at some point do this for a company and and, and at that point I will be buying hundred dollar devices. But at the current moment, I mean you. Uh, for less than a hundred bucks, you can buy all the parts and solder this. Um, I have the board right up here that and it, it's labeled the parts that go on it. So these things are, are, are cheap, um, but paying a hundred bucks for a cable just so I can do some very basic uh, hacking just seems like a lot. Yeah, those cables are awesome though. Yeah, I justified it as get a that? motivator to teach me. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody posted in the, the, I think, the SGF dev chat that they have a, a pineapple for sale. Uh, that person isn't in here. <laughs> so, uh, how many times have you been in jail? <laughs> no. So, I'm actually, putting my stuff up now. <laughs> so, uh, outside no. of not using the WP, um, what's probably the most common vulnerability that you see that, you know, be like avoided by most companies and people? For companies, I would say the biggest vulnerability, and I've been, and, and so, so I was a, a security analyst in 2019, and I was only a security analyst for one year because I started in 2019, and what happened one year after 2019 was everybody who only had one year of experience got fired. <laughs> um, but I will say, uh, looking over that company and then thinking about the other companies that I've looked at in my life, um, the, 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 the pieces of paper with the Wi-Fi password on it laying all over the place, uh, even here, right here in front of me. <laughs> I think that's what this is. Yeah, like you see this at companies all over the place. Um, and I get what we're doing here and, and why that's here. I'm not, I'm not picking on them. But uh, I mean, I, I worked for, for software security companies that had the pa had hundreds of pieces of paper laying all over the office with their password on it. It's clean desk policy. That's what I guess I'm getting at. That's what that's called. Um, just paying attention to your environment and not putting the password on your desk. <laughs> this is probably the biggest thing I see. But it, it, you're talking like vulnerabilities though, like vulnerabilities with the protocol type of thing? Yeah. Uh, the, the uh, so the WPA2 doesn't, uh, it doesn't encrypt. So WPA2 uh, is encrypted, obviously, so is WEP. Um, the data between the client and the access point, most of it's encrypted. But what's not encrypted in WPA2 are the um, session management information. Um, so like you're saying, I want to be connected to that access point. That message isn't clear. It's not encrypted. Not a big deal. Um, I don't want to be connected to this access point, or I'm an access point and I don't want you connected. That also is in the clear. So anybody can send those. And what I don't get is that's been a vulnerability since 2004 <laughs> in WPA2. And it is still the vulnerability. And we just keep on trucking. We just keep on moving along with that vulnerability being out there and every day people get more and more, uh, more and more involved in attacking that vulnerability because it's so out there. Um, so when you're talking about the, the protocol side of things, that's the, 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 the session management uh, not being encrypted is the biggest issue. And it is, and it is in WPA3, it's encrypted, so you can't do that. Yeah, what's up? Are password managers like 1Password or LastPass being like a single point of failure? Is, is the trade-off of that worth it to avoid the kind of thing you were just talking about? The, the, the experts beyond me say yes. <laughs> I say it's a personal thing. If, if, you're, if, if you're the kind of person that walks away and leaves your workstation open, then you probably would be better off using a, 
a, a book <laughs> locking it in your drawer with your passwords on it because anybody can walk up and just, hey, I'm on your password manager. Um, so I think it's more of a personal thing and how you, you operate. But if you, if you look up the majority of the, the experts out there say that password manager is the best thing to use. I use password managers. I don't know. Any of my passwords that actually mean anything, like my email and all that, I don't know a single one. <laughs> I don't know any of them uh, because they're all 25 characters and they're all completely random. Um, you're never going to guess those. But single point of failure, yeah. Um, I trust myself. Like I said, I think it's more of a personal thing to answer that question. Yeah. So. Yeah, what's the little box there with the two antennas? I missed what you called that. This one? No, the one you were holding. The, this one? No. One on, no. To your oh, left. Yeah. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what you, this is the war driver. This is the one that, that okay, has a. Uh, yeah, um, this. What would be the advantage to that? You know, there's Wiggle, and you right. can put that on an Android, and you uh -huh. got GPS, and you can do, do uh, cell towers and everything with Wiggle, and mm -hmm. then you can download the CVS. So this actually has a. If, this has a. a there's a part of, there's a program that's on this already uh -huh. on the firmware okay. that you can uh, if you want to, it'll automatically upload to Wiggle. This is oh. a, a, a this is actually called a WarDriver, uh, WarDriver.uk by Joseph Hewlett. Is, okay. He's the person who designed this and he actually sells the circuit board for it, and he works with Wiggle. What what was that again? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the Jason guy? Hewlett, I believe is his name. Jason. Uh, and his website is WarDriver.uk. Okay, or whatever you can. Yeah. And they're asking about the Arduino versus the Pi. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a Pi Zero W, which has wireless built in for like twenty six bucks now. Mm -hmm. That's so, uh, that's what's know, in that's what's in the uh, okay. Monogachi. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the W has got the wireless on the board. And, um, I have a, I have a, a stack of them. Somewhere in here, uh, Pi Zeros. The, uh, the, they're Ponagachis, and all it is is just a Pi Zero. That's it. It's just a Pi Zero. And it does the whole Ponagachi thing um, by itself. One thing I was going to mention on the password manager thing, you t talked about 25 character random passwords. Can we all like get on the bandwagon of shaming companies that like only let you do 12 character passwords? All right. Please. <laughs> Actually, it makes me mad when I have to go like change the slider in one password. <laughs> to make my password less secure. Well, Anyways. It's worse when they tell you exactly what characters to use and you can't use Yeah. Them. <laughs> yep, yep. It's not good. It's That's not right. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't want to go too much longer. If you have more questions, um, definitely hit up uh, Chris in the Discord. I'm sure that he'll be around mm -hmm. for some questions. Or get yourself an RFID yes. thing, and, and it's got my, uh, my portfolio website. Is on, uh, that's basically Perfect. all that, that card is, and you can reach me on any of my, any of my things, or go to hackwoods.com. Doc, doc, Actually, hackwoods.com, I own that domain too, but hackwoods.academy and uh, sign up for the newsletter and you'll hear about all kinds of things I do. Yeah. Got a couple closing slides, but let's all give Chris a oh. huge round of applause.